We're glad to know you're still watching The Breakfast on the Plus TV Africa, and we're being joined by the IOM Chief of Missions. IOM is the International Organization for Migrations, especially at this time when Nigerians are talking about the Jaguar Syndrome. Everybody wants to leave, but not so many are leaving uh, through legitimate means and all that. Some people go through the seas, some people go through other means, and uh, we're concerned about the safety of these people. We have information that nearly 3,800 people died on migration routes within and from the Middle East and North America, which uh, they just call uh, MENA. And we're glad that we're being joined this morning by Mr. Laurent Dibor, uh, the IOM Chief of Missions. Welcome to the program. Good morning, thank you. Okay. Uh, well, this debt toll, uh, 3,800 3, is quite a number. Uh, what are these I the issues that lead to that? What, what is happening, really? Well, first, first of all, uh, we have to say that it's it's only those that we find the bodies. So I think we, we can multiply that by two minimum, um, which is quite unfortunate. But um, yeah, I think the, the uh, post-COVID situation is, is leading to a lot of people who have lost jobs or opportunities and, and they are uh, looking a way to go abroad. Um, we have noticed an increase of, of traffickers and smugglers offering their services because it's like an offer and demand. So those are promising them uh, ways to go and reach Europe. So unfortunately, a lot of people are actually trying their way in, in a regular way. The fact is that they don't necessarily know it's irregular, so they, they are just promised a job, but it's not, it's not the case. So they are just ending up in a situation. We find a lot of them in Libya, as the case with Nigerians, or uh, in the desert, in Niger. There they start to be exploited, and, and we, we uh, have offices there, they, they receive them, and, uh, and some of them are saying, like, actually, I was deceived, I want to go back home, and then we take care of them and, and bring them back here and start discussing with them and see what their future life will be. Okay. How well are you involved in taking care of the root causes of this problem? Mm -hmm. Because for me, what I've observed is the fact that most of the embassies do not give visas hmm. as much as they should have and so you find people looking for other means to get to where they want to get to are you working with embassies in any way to encourage them to give nigerians who legitimate legitimately want to go out there and add value to their economies hmm. visas instead of denying them visas no exactly so we are intergovernmental organization it means that we, we are actually bringing around the table governments to discuss the issues worldwide but it is the case with africa and and then all all other countries of destination the fact is that they they are they have legal pathways we are asking for more bilateral routes so that like germany who is currently discussing this with nigeria is selecting some specific people so they look for a certain profile so they will then we, we work on vocational training, for example, here yeah, to actually make them having the skills which are needed. And that happens. There is also discussion with the Netherlands for the time being. The UK is one big destination for Nigeria. They are also open, although they are questioning a little bit now the, 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 the important number of, of Nigerians who are joining their family members who are studying. But, but there are such, such discussion. The, the issue is the number. It's uh, they not necessarily will take hundreds of thousands of Nigerians because they also have other nationalities. There is a pressure, migratory pressure from other regions, from eastern part, for example, of the world, going trying to go so to some countries. So if it exists, it remains limited and very conditioned to a certain number of uh, uh, criteria, education being one or experience. So the other alternative and the root cause is to actually find alternatives in the country and invest what they, they have uh, in terms of skills or identifying what other skills can be developed for them to work in, in the country. But that's the most tricky part because, because there are those people who are promising them uh, jobs which do not necessarily exist. When you go to them and say, actually, you can stay in Nigeria and invest the money that you will pay this person to, to move into a certain job in your country, they don't listen to us that much. So it's, it's the difficulty of uh, um, us talking to them and they say, stay. 
Okay, by interfacing with the government, um, you also have, okay, with the migrants themselves that sometimes meet these uh, unfortunate uh, situations wherever they find themselves, you find basic reasons why they left their country, for instance. And that also, uh, to me, should be um, a talking point when you interact with the government of whichever country that mm -hmm. you are talking to. How much is the level of this interaction with the government so that things could be changed in such a way that maybe some people who legitimately uh, wouldn't have moved or uh, would stay back? What do you discuss with the government and mm -hmm. how far is the success so far? Yeah, there are discussions and engagement of the government in the creation of employment in the con in countries generally. That's also a, a way because there is an engagement which is necessary at the country of origin. There are some programs for youth. Um, so I think for the next five years there is a program done by the United Nations on creating 20 million employment in Nigeria. Uh, but it, it remains a little bit the same. Um, there is not enough information about the fact that there are opportunities and there are, there are mechanisms which exist. So Whose fault is that? Well, all the structure or the, the, the reaching the people is not, they, they don't look necessarily because they don't know that there are certain institutions who may do that. The institutions are not necessarily promoting enough and going. I think there is also a fear of having a, a very high number of demand and then deceptions. Uh, if they come, if you have hundreds of thousands where well, you can offer 10,000, then you, you prefer to be what they call low profile and do the 10,000 uh, in a certain way and uh, without having a long queue of people uh, willing to, to have the job and then, then it will have a negative effect. So it's, it's always extremely difficult to manage actually because, because of the number. Okay, so you've been here since 2001? Oh, it's been established since the, the day office day. established. I, I arrived recently. Oh, okay. nine, I worked here years ago, and then I came back now. Uh, you love Nigeria, don't you? I like Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> so, how would you rate the level of success recorded by this agency, especially with regards to the fact that we are now knowing that? Because I, I didn't know much about what you do. Um, there is not enough information out there about the opportunities that this organization offers to those who have come back. How, how would you rate the success and what can you do to improve it? In terms of uh, return and support to those who have come back, I think we have, we have so far assisted almost 34,000 people to, to come back. Out of them, like at 85%, it's uh, 20, almost, almost 30,000 have been received tailored assistance to return. Mm. That may vary from various angles. We, we have also mental health to be provided for those to return because it's it's kind of a failure when you come back. They have to face the family and the community, so we have to work also on this and them to have a self-esteem. So we work on that, but then also providing them skills and some jobs. We have open shops. We make them entrepreneurs, starting a new business. When they are not necessarily business oriented, we, we work with the private sector and we've placed them in some enterprises. So, uh, so that's really tailored one to one. So, to that, I would say it is it is kind of a success. Give it's, us it's a clear picture them. of how you help them come in. Uh, we know that there are some who are endangered in some very crazy zones in the deserts, and some uh, have been, you know, have been made prostitutes in some parts of Africa in the course of trying to migrate to Europe and all of that. Do you go to those places to help them out, or mm -hmm. how do you coordinate these processes yeah. of helping them return home? We actually have offices um, in quite a large part of the world. We have 400 offices in some countries. We have several offices, like is the case here. Uh, so we don't, we not, uh, us here, go to Libya or, or Niger, for example, but, but we have our colleagues there who are supporting them. So. They are making information, going to those who are in detention. They are going to, to places to inform on the danger of the traffickers and the smugglers. And that's how actually all the Nigerians are coming to us. They go register, they take care of them, they, pro they move them out of jail, put them in, in, uh, in housing the time we organize their return. They communicate with us and that's how we start preparing their integration. And anywhere in the world Nigerians can do Recently, we do approach our offices. Recently, we have taken some uh, a lady who, who was prostituted, indeed, uh, forcibly in, uh, in the Middle East. She just came back and, uh, and we reintegrated her, but also healing her 
psychologically and physically, and we will work on our integration here with the family. Okay, uh, well, let me go back to um, the opportunities that are uh, available to the people who intend to migrate or who have come back that you say you keep at a low profile. Uh, the danger, Nigerian experience, is that when something is a low profile, some people that may not even need it are the ones that will get the information. So what is the mechanism you put in place to make sure that the people who really need this are the ones that get these opportunities? Because, for instance, you're talking to a politician and you're telling them we need only 10,000 and the people, targeted um, audience that will be given this information are the people who are, are close to them. So the people who may not may really need it will not be there. So what have you put in place to guard against this? Well, we have selection criteria, and it's true that uh, it, it's driven by um, the, the demand, the offer, the, what the market needs. So, um, and, and I agree with you that it would be impossible to make a large campaign, and because it would actually be impossible to manage. So, I no, understand the, the point. On the, on on the contrary, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do a large campaign. I'm saying that if you keep it low profile, you tell me and Maureen, for instance, that we need 10,000 people. It's only the people that get mm. to you that you can profile, you can, you can select. But if it's thrown open, that means the people who may really need this will be part of the people that you need to profile. You can only, you can only interview, you can only select from the people that come to you. What if these people were only selected by those, by those who got the information low? Key. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. So why not Let's leave see, it? See what you mean. In a way, way. Yeah, we try to penetrate well the community because we work with the returnees or the other community themselves. So actually, we don't pass necessarily by an institution. It's not a top-down okay. approach. So, for example, with the returnees, we we work. They organize themselves in in a community or an association, and they help us to disseminate the information to their peers. So it's a really it's a small community-driven approach. But even themselves, okay, it can be biased because they will go to around them, themselves. So it's, it's quite complex, I understand, to have an extremely large uh, I would say information to all to be processed. We have to go through a certain structure in the country. So I believe that it's, it's more, it's fairer by going through the people themselves and their communities and those who are passing messages. They are, they are, we have like ambassadors among the returnees who went through this. They know this where to target people. So they are our messengers, it's migration messengers among them. So they are, they are the ones who pass the information. And then we have to tell them at a certain point that it might be complicated to do more because we need funding, we need support, technical support. So, so that's in a way um, limiting the, uh, our, our impact, but, but we try to pass a message through them and those who succeed to look at those options instead of only looking at migration as the alter on, on the alternative. What's your pri primary target when you're talking about these opportunities that are available? Which are demographic, which kind of people are you targeting to give these opportunities to? Well, it's, uh, it's according to the, the analysis that we have on the people who are leaving, which are generally quite, quite young. They have um, um, good knowledge, good qualification. It's not high qualification. Um, so it's, it, and then there are some who are located in certain areas. Uh, we have them in um, Edo State, although it's diminishing. P people are, are living in, uh, in lesser number now from Edo State. It starts now from Kano, in, for some months now, we have more departure from Kano. So we look at the profile of the people, and that's determine how we target uh, also our audience. So IOM is um, in different parts of the world, I assume. Yeah, just yesterday, about 80, 80 migrants drowned in a shipwreck of Greece, uh, 80 people. Tell me, comparing uh, the operations in different parts of the world and what happens here in Nigeria, would you say Nigeria is one of your most trouble spots, or is just what obtains in other parts of the world? I wouldn't say it's, a, it's the, the most complex spot. Uh, it's, it's important in number, and because also it was one of the most populous countries of Africa, if not the most, and, and, and the biggest. So the pressure and the youth is extremely uh, important portion, which are looking and, and, and for, for opportunities. So it's, it's an important number. It has a 
a negative reputation indeed, but I don't think it's, it's, it's the highest number. It, it became recently the high number of people entering Italy, uh, so, so then we may generalize and say for in Europe it's one of the, of the biggest number, but you still have important number from Syria. We have if you look at all the, the type, Ukraine, Venezuela is, is one of the biggest number of people on the move, uh, but it's related to, to specific crises. So, so it's, it's, we cannot say that it's number one. So Nigeria one is, not, is not notorious in, in, in that sense. <laughs> uh, we're not no. the, the people who are seeking to Jackba. You know what Jackba <laughs> means now, right? You should know. We're not the most people in the world seeking to leave our country to other parts of the world. Unfortunately, no. But, yeah. but what do you Fortunately, do? we are not. <laughs> Fortunately, we are not. I like that. But so, I mean, there are a lot of other what, people. What really do you do, do when, when, when people, when you get these people and you want them to return? Some of these people really fled from crisis, like you said. So, how do you resettle them in lands that their lives are in danger? What do you do in that regard? We don't want them to return. That's the important point. We just deal with those who who decided to return. So we offer our services, it's voluntary return. Okay. So just because it's the, okay. the wording is important. Yes. Because we, we are against forcing them to, to come back. We, we work with governments who say they must come back. We, we say, no, this is not appropriate. In case, particularly, their returns in, will make them in danger. So that's part of also the negotiation. But any return so is prepared. So if a person says, I want to come back, we say, okay, what's, where do you come from? Is it safe? Uh, who, for example, for ladies, you mentioned those who may be forcibly prostituted. You say, who has actually advised you to go? How do you know it's safe to go? Because some, in some cases, you may have a family member who have actually encouraged the, the woman to go, so he may be part of the trafficking. So we have to look at that. There are children who are, we are taking care of. We don't necessarily return them to their family unless we do a really uh, an analysis on the social context and to some extent, we put them in, uh, either we negotiate that they should stay where they are, or if they come back, we, we, we look at institutions who can take care of them. So it's very tailored to also the, their own situation and safety. Rwanda um, has been said to be where UK has decided to take uh, Nigerians, well, illegal migrants, not just Nigerians, too. Um, are there Nigerians there who are there against their will in Rwanda? Would you know that? Oh, that's a very long debate. On, uh, <laughs> um, they are in, indeed requested to go there. So um, to what extent, if you are asked to go, and because it's a process, you would say they force me to, or it's because you are actually looking for refuge and, and protection, and you'd see it's a procedure that you, you are following. So. Indeed, ideally, I don't think they would like to go there, but they understand that it is the, the way to, to proceed and, and to claim for their, uh, their protection. So they are kind of yeah, <laughs> okay. forcibly asked or, or, or strongly asked to go that way. Yeah. Mm. Okay, let's, let's look at, you've, you've been talking about, we've been talking about you and government, the interaction, level of interaction. What about the private sector? What's their level of involvement mm. in this? We, we are more and more engaging with them because we have succeeded to have some businesses taking back either uh, people who are taking, people who will return and at the same time also encouraging youth to, to enter into their business. But uh, we have done a pilot with 150 persons who succeeded to work in uh, hydroponic farms. Um, so they, they are open to actually look at uh, integrating people back or people from the community. But same, we, we want to now expand and, uh, and work with the private sector in a larger scale for them to encourage or to, to, to start with, like pairing them with vocational training centers, for example, as if they say we don't have necessarily the person with the qualification required for our job. So I say, okay, help us to develop the the, the, the schools or the, the vocational training centers which will prepare them better to enter into your business. So that's what we are discussing now. Mm. 
And then what, you like Loki so much, you like the <laughs> <Luke laughs> professor so much. I'm wondering how much you've interacted with the media, for instance, you know, to help uh, propagate this gospel, as it were, uh, to the people. Because you need orientation, you need uh, sensitization and all that. So what has been your level of cooperation with media? No, we do, we do, and we want to actually largely pass communication on, on migration, right choice. Uh, when I say low, low key, it's because our budget is not, is limited <laughs> to a certain extent. And if I have the budget, I would do a 10 million placement <laughs> of you a year. But, uh, but we do, we do try to communicate largely to the people. And, um, and we have now, we are developing a, a new strategy on communication to the youth, on their participation, on their um, looking at themselves, placing themselves, preparing themselves before before moving. Uh, the Java is one option, but yeah. you can be prepared better. Yeah. And, uh, we have sites which provide information on how to get and where to go for getting more information um, and, and getting the, the right documents, avoiding the, um, what they call the, the, the traffickers and the smugglers. Um, or if they decided still to go, where to go in case they face issues. So, and we need communication for that, largely. Okay, now that you have the opportunity that will not cost you 10 million, <laughs> <laughs> what's your strongest message to the people? Um, as we no, uh, basically, I think it's uh, get prepared and, and do not believe anyone will promise you, uh, uh, particularly if the promise goes with you paying something in advance. Mm -hmm. There is nobody who is asking you to pay money to get a job. The, the person should actually offer you a salary and not vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think once you start to pay, it means that it's fake because it just just be abused. Okay, <laughs> I think that should be a good way to, a uh, good place to leave it this uh, morning. I would like to thank you for coming on the show uh, to, thank you. to throw so much light on what is going on. And we do hope that whoever should hear it is hearing right now that uh, it's not always greener on the other side. <laughs> you have to look inward sometimes and uh, all the things that you're looking for you might just find. Like we say in local uh, parlance, what you're looking for in Sokoto might just be in your Shokoto. So, <laughs> Uh, we well, thank you, Mr. Laurent Dabibert, for thank coming you. on the show this morning. Thank you very much. Well, that's how we wrap it up on the show this morning. But just before we go, remember, don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. That, those are the words of Madam C.J. Walker. And uh, that's how it's been on the show this morning. My name is Nyamgu. Okay. And I am Maureen. And do have a splendid day. Join us tomorrow. <laughs>